There we go. We're there. Hey, um, we regularly preach through books of the Bible if you're new to Story Church, and we're finishing out Jonah today, as Ken said. And so we've titled the sermon series Boundless, and what we're looking at in this series are attributes of God, his grace, his mercy, his kindness, uh, his, his mission here on earth, and, and how he is not bound up by those things, but he is, he is completely untethered and can do as he wills. And so today, we're going to consider God's boundless compassion. God's boundless compassion, his kindness towards his people. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when when I read the Bible, and while I'm reading it, I I just really want to be in the moment that I'm reading about. Like, I think about Noah's Ark. Like, Noah is this crazy guy in the middle of nowhere building this gigantic boat, and then all of a sudden, torrential downpour comes that will not stop. And I'm like, man, that would have been cool to be a part of that. And just see that and, and witness that. I think, of, uh, I think of Jonah chapter three, which we read last week, where Jonah preaches this simple, clear gospel message and 120,000 plus people come to repentance and faith uh, from the kings and the nobles on down to the regular people. I think of Pentecost in the book of Acts when the spirit of God comes rushing on his people and thousands come to faith and are baptized form the first church, and I read that, and I'm like, man, I think I want to be there. And then you go down through church history, and you, and you consider different events, like the Welsh Revival, or the First Great Awakening, or the Azusa Street Revival, or the Jesus People Movement. I think of Spurgeon preaching in the Metro Tabernacle, and I think, man, I want to, to be there. I would love to witness that. I would love to witness that in our day. Now, I say that to say, Jonah got a front row seat to all of that. Everything described in those events, a a supernatural move of God's power and of God's gospel, Jonah got to witness that, and and in some ways, he was responsible for it. He was the one who preached the message, and God empowered the preaching of that message. And yet, as Ken read the scripture for us, we saw on repeat, Jonah Jonah was angry. Jonah was angry. Jonah was angry. He was so angry that he said three different times, it is better for me to die than it is to live. Why is Jonah so angry at this moment of mass repentance and mass revival? I think it's because his public enemy number one has come to faith. He knew of Nineveh's past persecution of Israel. He knew that Nineveh was currently this this governmental overlord of the state of Israel, and he anticipated a future persecution at the hands of Nineveh, and so he did not want them to come to faith. They were public enemy number one, and he wanted God's boundless compassion to not go to them, but just to be reserved for him and for Israel. Who is them for you? Who is public enemy number one for you? Maybe I could just speak with some broad strokes here. Maybe you're a conservative, politically speaking, and the flavor of the day of who your public enemy is changing. A few weeks ago, it was Bud Light and Dylan Mulvaney, and then it was Disney, and then it was Target, and somehow last week, it was Jesus Chicken from Chick-fil-A. I don't get it, but all of a sudden, it's like, man, that's my enemy. If those people come to faith... Will you rejoice or will you be full of rage? Maybe you're a liberal leaning, politically speaking, and the flavor of the day is changing for you as well. It's always Donald Trump. It's always going to be Donald Trump. But maybe to a lesser degree, it's, it's Ron DeSantis or Tucker Carlson. It's certainly anyone who holds a traditional view of gender, sexuality, and the family unit. If those people come to faith, will you be rejoicing or angry? And I know that's like an awkward thing, and I'm just, I'm trying to offend every one of you very intentionally. (laughs) And that's out there, though. That's distant. That's not personal. We can bring it a little closer to home. Maybe public enemy number one for you is the distant father who left your family when you were three. Maybe it's the neglecting mom who refused to nurture you. Maybe it's the spouse who left you for another person, the drunk driver who killed your family member, the abusive authority figure who crushed you, the sibling who lied and slandered and gossiped and tried to ruin your reputation. All of that is tragic, and yet, how would you respond if those people came to faith? Would you be rejoicing or angry? I'm willing to bet we're a lot more like Jonah than we'd like to admit, because I'm a lot more like Jonah than I would like 
to admit. I bet many of us would respond in anger. So let's consider this idea of anger for a second. There are two types of anger the scriptures give us. There's, there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Righteous anger is, is, is what comes from within us when we see an injustice according to God's eyes. So a couple of examples of that, like maybe we have this righteous anger when we, we hear of a, a rapist going free because of some kind of mistrial. We have a righteous anger when our hard-earned dollars are being ripped from us so that we can provide state-sponsored abortion. We feel a righteous anger for those things, and we should. Jesus felt a righteous anger when he walked into the temple and people were perverting the use of the temple and he started flipping tables. There was true injustice in God's eyes. However, there is unrighteous anger. Unrighteous anger is birthed when our expectation of justice is not met. Jonah was angry because he thought Nineveh deserved disaster, and yet God chose to relent from that disaster and give them grace. God's desire was repentance. Jonah's desire was disaster, and he felt there was an injustice there. But do you hear the problem in that equation? The problem is God. The problem is God not meeting Jonah's standards. When Jonah thought that the Ninevites deserved destruction, God decided to give them boundless compassion. His idea of justice was not met. And he had this unrighteous anger birthing within his soul. And I think a lot of us are like that. I think a lot of us, we don't go to the scriptures to determine what is just and what is unjust. And then when we witness things that we think are unjust in our world, we feel this anger, and it's an unrighteous anger, not a righteous anger, and that anger destroys us from in the inside out. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to consider the idea of anger as it's thread through Jonah chapter 4. Hey, if you're new here, welcome. This is what we do. <laughs> hey, you know, we love the Bible because the Bible's real, right? Right? And, and we're not going to be like these happy, clappy, like we're never angry people. We're angry. It happens. It's real. The Bible's real. The Bible just tells us what to do with our anger. Sin not in our anger. It doesn't say don't feel angry. It says sin not in your anger. Okay? So welcome. Here's what we're going to look at. Jonah's anger, how anger treats us, how it deals with us, what it does to us, and then on the other hand, how God deals with us. Good? All right. First thing, Jonah's anger. Jonah's anger. Look back at verses one through four with me from chapter four of Jonah. But it, Nineveh's repentance, displeased Jonah's exce Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Uh, Here's what, what, what you see right here. Right out of the gates, Jonah is displeased with Nineveh's, Nineveh's repentance, and it leads to anger in his soul. But look at verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord. Now, here's what I tell you all the time. If you're sad, if you're disappointed, if you're depressed, if you're angry, take it to the Lord. Take it to the throne of grace in your time of need. Be met with God's mercy. I tell you that all the time. Go to the Lord in your anger. Yes and amen. However, look at the content of Jonah's prayers here. Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That's why I fled to Tarshish, for I knew what you were going to do. This is Jonah's prayer it is not a pleading for relief. This is Jonah making an accusation against God and against God's character. This is not a godly prayer. This is a prayer where Jonah wants to point fingers at God for his failure, namely saving the Ninevites because of who God is. So again, in this scenario, Jonah is angry with God. That's not okay. It's okay to be angry with life's circumstances, but in our anger, we never accuse God of failing us. God will not fail you. He has never failed you. He's not gonna start now. 
So let's consider what it is about God that really irked Jonah, and maybe it will reveal stuff within our souls, draw some, some things out in us. First, Jonah is angry due to his resentment over God's boundless compassion to sinners. Jonah says, I know this is the kind of God that you are. And he quotes God when he reveals himself to the people of Israel in Exodus, when, when God says, I'm a merciful God and gracious. I am abounding in steadfast love. I am a forgiving God. I am a God who relents from disaster. Jonah quotes who God is. Jonah knew this theologically about God. Okay? He would have been raised among the people of Israel who regularly, week after week, when they gathered in the temple, they would sing this together. They would recite the character of God to one another. Jonah knew things about God theologically, but that's not it. Jonah had also personally experienced this character of God in his own life. He experienced it when he came to faith. He experienced it when he got his calling to be a prophet. He experienced God's grace when he was commissioned to go to Nineveh. He experienced God's grace when he was saved from the storm in chapter two. He experienced God's grace when he was swallowed by the fish and saved by the fish. Time and time and time and time again throughout Jonah's life, he experienced God's grace. It seems though, that Jonah wanted to be the one who got to create categories of who received that grace. It seemed that he wanted to say that, hey, hey, me and my people, we get to experience God's grace, but, but Nineveh and, and those evil pagans out there, man, they don't get God's grace. Perhaps uh, Jonah's attitude here in, in chapter four comes to light a little bit in one of Jesus's most famous parables. You're, you might be familiar with it. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son. And, and that, that parable has many different meanings. So, so what's going on in that parable is that the younger son demands from the father, hey, I want my inheritance early. I want all of my money, and he runs. He goes to Vegas, he squanders it in reckless sin, and then he finds himself just lonely and isolated, without money, without family, without a home, and he's reduced to eating from a pig trough. So he comes to his senses one day and says, maybe, just maybe, I can journey back to my father's house, and when I get there, my, my father will accept me, and I can just be a servant in his own home. And so he does that. He heads home. But as he approaches, his father spies him from the distance, and he runs out to meet his son along the road, and his father embraces him and kisses him. And then the father calls out to his servants and says, put a robe over my son's shoulders, Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Restore him to his position in this family. And then the whole community throws a party where they celebrate the son's returning back home. And the father exclaims, my son was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he was found. We love this parable as a picture of God's boundless compassion to even the most wicked among us. And we should celebrate that. However, if we were to keep reading in Luke 15, we would see another side of the story. We learn of the older brother who resents the mercy that was shown to his younger brother. He never ran off with his father's money. He never squandered his inheritance. He never did an unrighteous thing. He never came crawling back. He never disgraced his father's name and reputation. And so he goes to the father and he makes accusations saying, I was never like my younger brother, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this wicked son of yours comes home who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. Do you see Jonah's attitude in the older brothers? Jonah wants to die because God had shown mercy to the Ninevites and the Lord even used Jonah to do it. And if you keep going in Luke 15, it finishes like this. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There is a spiritual pride in the older brother and a spiritual pride in Jonah that leads to resentment over God choosing to save those that we would never choose. And if we were to learn though, the joy of salvation, and the marvel of God's grace in redemption. 
If we were to learn of how God's heart, heart bursts with love when his people re, are redeemed and come to him for salvation, there is no joy in heaven and on earth than seeing the forgiveness of sins. But Jonah thought the Ninevites don't deserve forgiveness. Their gross sins should just be condemned and judged. It never dawned on Jonah that it was more glorious for God to provide forgiveness of sins than it was to judge those people as wicked. So again, who is it for you? Who's your public enemy number one? You know, you know. And if you were to hear, man, that person's being drawn back to the Lord, how would you respond? I, I know how I would respond, probably cynically, with a little bit of a hard heart. I've, we've been here before. We've been down that road before. I've heard all the words before. It's not, it's too good to be true. And yet, God calls us to put to death our cynical hard hearts and believe that he is actively in the work of drawing people to himself. And when he is doing the work, we cannot stop it. And so instead of us having resentment over God seeming to choose the people that we would never choose, how about we just throw fuel on that fire via our prayers and our love and our kindness and our invitation into our lives? So first, Jonah was angry because of resentment over God's boundless compassion to even the most wicked of sinners. Number two, Jonah was angry at God for being God. In other words, hear me, church, God has freedom to be God. In Romans 11, we are told God is not in debt to us for anything. In Job, we are confronted with the question, who are we to ask God what he's doing? In Romans 9, we, we are told, who, who does God have to answer back to us? And when we see in verse four, God asking Jonah the question, do you do well to be angry? He is essentially saying to Jonah, did I have to consult with you before I did this? Did I need to call a board meeting and say, hey, hey, Jonah, pull up a seat. I'm about to go save the Ninevites. You cool with that? Are you cool if I, if I choose them to, to come be a part of my kingdom? Jonah didn't want God to have freedom to be God. You see, Jonah didn't re reject God's salvation when he was receiving it. He didn't reject God's goodness to him when he was swallowed up and saved by a fish and spit out three days later. What he does reject is the extent of that grace, where he imagines that only Israel deserves to be saved by grace. He is angry with God because God is not doing what Jonah wants him to do. So Jonah is angry that our God is boundless and eternal and infinite and all-powerful, and he will do however he pleases without consulting us. And so what we can do is just put our anger to death and say, you're God, I'm not, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I'm gonna get on board with that, God. If you resist the will of God, number one, you're gonna exhaust yourself. Number two, you're just gonna be angry. You're just gonna be angry because God is gonna do things that are outside of your comfort zone, that are outside of your idea. He's going to do exceedingly and abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, which isn't always positive in our minds. And yet he will do it because he is God. Finally, Jonah was angry because Jonah was self-interested. Again, Jonah is great with his salvation throughout the book. He's great uh, later on in chapter four when, when the plant is put up over his head and he gets shade from that plant. He is happy when miracles are being given to him, but he's not happy with Nineveh. Jonah is basically saying, I want things for me, but not for thee. Where have we heard that before? If the Ninevites are in on redemption, God, then I'm out. Look at how Jonah responds. He responds as the most determined legalist. He would not associate with the newly saved Ninevites. He wouldn't mingle in their city. He would not share in their worship or their praise of God. He would not participate in ministry with them despite clear evidence that God had saved the Ninevites and brought them into his kingdom. Jonah himself would not accept them. Instead, he sets up a booth outside of Nineveh and he willingly accepts his own isolation and hardship in the sun all because 
he thought he was more holy and deserving than the people of Nineveh. Jonah would do his own thing, and his own thing would be watch, watching miserably as the Ninevites praised God. He was self-interested, and it led to his own isolation and hardship all because he refused to see that his public enemy, number one, had come to faith, and instead of calling them enemy, he now calls them friend. And does that not remind us of the gospel, where we are told in the New Testament that while we were still enemies of God, Jesus Christ died for us? You see, we're not Jonah in this story. We're actually the Ninevites, Because as much as you have someone in your mind that's public enemy number one, guess what? You were someone else's public enemy number one. You hurt someone. You slandered against someone. You abandoned someone. You hurt someone so deeply so that you became Nineveh to them. And yet God saw fit to draw you by his grace and kindness to himself. And that person wasn't there to stop it. God did what he wanted to do. You see, we were God's enemies, and yet he saw fit to save us. So Jonah continues to just grow in his anger because our sovereign God was doing as he pleased. But look what the anger does to him. That's the second point here. How does the anger deal with Jonah's soul? What what does it do to him? First thing I want you to notice is that Jonah missed out on revival. Look at verse five with me, chapter four. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Jonah, again, has left the city and he's missing out on what God is doing there. Here's what anger causes for us. It causes us to miss God's work around us. It causes us to... to, to, close our eyes and be hard-hearted and hard-headed towards God's work all around us. God is actively doing things at all times in our lives and in the lives around us, but if we are hardened in our hearts by anger, we're just not gonna see that. And again, who wants to miss out on that? I wish I was in Jonah 3. Don't you? And here's the truth. Jonah 3 can happen in 2023 in Rancho Cucamonga and beyond. Can it not? Right, and and here's what we love to do. We love to hate on California, right? I hate Cal, listen, I don't like traffic. I certainly don't like taxes. I mean, there's there's like, I I am the most like, don't tell me what to do person in this room. Okay, so I'm probably living in the wrong state. However, hear me. California is not too far gone for God's grace. If God has boundless compassion, and he does, then there is no one in our lives, in this city or in this state, that are too far gone for God's grace. And I want to see that happen. But if all I'm doing is sitting here spewing in anger and in rage because God is working around me, I'm not going to be a part of seeing what he truly does. And I want to be a part of it, don't you? So anger causes us to miss what God's doing around us. But anger also causes us to miss God's work in us. Look at verse six. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of this plant. You see, what what, what happens here is, is Jonah is happier about his own physical remedies than he is about the spiritual remedies going on in Nineveh. And then the plant withers and dies, and then he's angry again and wants to die again. Again, Jonah is just self-interested. And what this is showing us is that Jonah was refusing to allow his own heart to be mercifully transformed by the grace of God. It was two steps forward and three steps back throughout the book of Jonah. And I wish there was kind of a bow tied on the end of this book so it could be clean and easy and I could preach a different sermon, but that's not what's happening here in the word. Jonah is still angry and still wants to die. He is is allowing his own heart to be so hardened that he refuses to allow God to change him. Didn't need to be that way. He could have been changed. All, All the things about himself that he hates and all the things about yourself that you hate because let's be honest, like even if we, we live in a world of, you know, like kind of like self-love, 
like let's celebrate everything, look in the mirror and tell yourself how awesome you are, you know in the quiet of your soul when you're not sleeping at 2 a.m., there are things about yourself that you don't like. If there's not, you're not being honest with yourself. All of those things that we don't like, the things we say, the things we do. Paul from Romans chapter seven where he says, I do the very thing I don't wanna do. All of that can be changed for Jonah and can be changed for us. But here's what happens. We have all these areas that we wanna grow. We have God's grace and mercy and power over here. And then we build this wall right in between. That's called anger. Like God, you can't work there. You can't touch that. We refuse to allow him to work in our lives and change us and grow us all because we are so hard-hearted towards his power. Anger causes us to miss God's work around us and in us. And then anger causes us to act in ways that we don't want to. Look at verses seven and eight. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Anger causes us to act in ways that we don't want to. Did Jonah actually want to die? No, he didn't actually mean that. We have evidence of that. And when he gets thrown into the storm and he comes to his senses and he's like, I'm drowning, God save me. He didn't actually want to die, but he was so blinded by his rage that he begins to say things and do things that he didn't want to do. Anyone else? Right? Blinded by anger, blinded by hurt, blinded by response to perceived injustice, we say and we do things that we don't want to do. We act in ways we don't want to act. We hurt people we don't want to hurt. Why? Anger causes us to do that. Finally, anger leads to resentment, which renders us useless. If Jonah would have died, he would have been useless. (laughs) but even if he wasn't dead, he was sitting outside of the city just watching Nineveh do their thing and he wasn't participating in it. Okay, so here's what happens with anger. Anger teaches us a false lesson that that we are the ones that are in the right and we're gonna prove everyone wrong in the end. That's what anger teaches us. And, And yet, all that it does to us is it makes us sit on the sidelines while God's work is happening over there. It makes us useless to being used by God in what he's doing in our world and in our lives. Does any of that resonate with you? Does anger just eat you up from the inside? Is there a root of bitterness festering in your soul? And it's the only thing you can think about. It's the only thing you can dwell on. You can't seem to let it go. Are you finding yourself stalled out in your faith, not growing? Are you finding yourself just kind of cynical to the work of God in this world? Are you finding yourself wanting those who are far off and wicked in your eyes to not experience the grace of God that you've experienced? Does any of that resonate with you? I'm sure it does, and if it does, that's good because Jonah also teaches us how God deals with us even in our anger. Look at verses nine through 11 with me. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? This is giving us a picture of how God deals with us. As the book of Jonah as a whole gives us a picture of how God deals with us. He's talking to Jonah about this idea of pity. Pity can be translated as compassion. God feels pity, compassion, kindness towards the people of Nineveh, and he felt it towards Jonah throughout the book. But what does Jonah feel pity for? A plant. Like, I know there's plant people in this room, so I'm not going to offend anyone, but plants don't have souls, okay? Also, pets don't have souls. That's for free. Um, (laughs) That's probably more offensive. Um, 
And Jonah, Jonah is feeling this, this pity, this compassion, this heart of God towards a plant, not towards the 120,000 people in the city of Nineveh who experience God's grace. He is valuing inanimate objects over people made in the image of God. And God is confronting him with this fact and showing him, how foolish are you that you care about a plant more than you care about the people across the river that are worshiping me right now? Do I not get to choose who I have pity on? Do I not get to choose who I get to save? And yet, notice, in all of this, God doesn't crush Jonah. And God does not crush us. Even if Jonah is two steps forward and three steps back, even if Jonah is continuously hard-hearted towards his God and angry at his God, God continuously throughout the book shows him grace upon grace upon grace. As Jonah flees from God's presence, it is God who draws Jonah back into his presence. As we flee from the presence of God in our sin, it is Jesus who unites us back to the presence of God through his finished work on the cross. As Jonah is asleep to his calling and commissioning in the middle of a storm down in the bottom of a boat, it is God who awakens Jonah to his calling and to the beauty of being used by God. As we are asleep to being used by God in this world, it is Jesus who sends his spirit to live within us, to awaken us to the beauty of his calling and his purposes in this world. As Jonah is swallowed by a fish, tasting the depths of his depravity and darkness and grave for three whole days. It is Jesus who is swallowed by a grave after dying on a cross for the sake of our sins, tasting the depths of our depravity and our darkness and our grave for three days. As Jonah is spit out from that fish three days later and his feet are set on solid ground, saved and recommissioned by God. It is Jesus who is resurrected by the Spirit of God three days later to new life and he freely gives us new life that we now get to step into our calling and commissioning by God. It is Jonah who goes into Nineveh and preaches repentance. It is Jesus who confronts us and says, repent or perish. Jonah is shaded by a plant showing God's grace to him. Jesus is called the stump of Jesse that blooms into an oak of righteousness. And under his shade, we are covered and protected and have refuge by our good God. Jonah is full of bitterness and anger to the end. And it is Jesus who dies for those who are most full of bitterness and anger. It is Jesus who dies for his enemies, including Jonah and including you and I. How does God deal with us? boundless compassion time and time and time again we know that because Jonah quotes the character of God you are a God who is merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love and forgiving your people and relenting from disaster God dealt with Jonah that way he dealt with the sailors that way. He dealt with the captains that way. He dealt with the Ninevites that way. And he deals with you and I that way. And here's what happens. When that boundless compassion truly penetrates into our souls, anger melts away. And that anger begins to melt away. And we have freedom from that anger. And it helps us see and step into the work of God all around us where we wake up in the morning full of purpose and joy, eager to see what God has in store for that day. Use me, God, for whoever, whenever. That, that we're freed from that anger. It's not just about God's work around us, it's God's work in us, where his spirit begins to shape and mold us into the image of Jesus. And we're not God, giving God the stiff arm saying, you can't touch that. But rather we say, I belong to you. Do whatever you will with me. Change me and make me look more like Jesus. We get freed from anger and turned more and more into a loving people who live and love just like Jesus lived and loved. We're freed from anger so that root of bitterness doesn't take soil in our, in our hearts and it doesn't grow within us. How does God deal with us? He gives us boundless compassion that frees us from anger. I want that. 
But here's the deal. Jonah's conclusion is a bit odd, isn't it? It ends in a question. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and so much cattle? The author there in Jonah is leaving a hanging question at the end of this. No one knows how Jonah responds to this. I think that's intentional. I think we're meant to be confronted with the question ourselves. What's the question? Let me, if you'll permit me, kind of translate it into my version. God confronts Jonah and says, are you gonna let me be God? Are you gonna let me have mercy on whoever I please? Are you gonna be miserable because I choose to save your enemies? The ball's in your court, Jonah. You with me or against me? That's the question at the end of Jonah. And that's the question for every one of us in this room. Are we with God or against God? Our anger will put us staunchly in the position of being against God. And, and, and here's the deal. If you choose to be against God, hear me, that's gonna do two things to you. Number one, you're, gonna, you're gonna just gonna continue to grow in anger and then anger will have reverberating effects into, the, into the, every area of your life. Who wants to be around a perpetually angry person? Who wants to be around a person who wakes up looking for ways to be bothered? Who wants to live with a person who is just looking for ways to snap at the smallest of things? Your anger is just gonna continue to grow, but the second thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna lose, okay? You can't win in a game with God, all right? He's LeBron James and you're you in a basketball game, okay? You lose, especially Kermit. <laughs> if you don't know Kermit, he's over here and he, he thinks he's good at basketball. Um, <laughs> you're gonna lose. Every time you put yourself up against God, you're gonna lose because he is all powerful and he is infinite. You can't thwart his will. You can't overcome his sovereignty. He is God. You are not. You're gonna lose if you're against him. But if you're with him, it's the best place to be. Number one, you're, you're gonna be freed from that anger. But number two, you're gonna be on the right side of the power of God, not being against you, but being for you moving you along in your life, growing you, freeing you, and using you. So that's the question at the end of Jonah. This whole story about a reluctant prophet being sent to preach the good news of the gospel to the people that he hates the most. The very end of it is the question, are you gonna be with me and be used by me? in the wickedness of your city, with the people you hate the most, with those that you want to die, and yet my will, God says, is to relent from disaster and save and redeem and transform. Are you with him or are you against him? That's the question. Pray with me. Father, we love you, and we do thank you for your boundless compassion towards us. that you are a good God who is merciful and gracious, abounding in love, relenting from disaster and forgiving your people. God, where we have anger in our hearts, would you dislodge that by your grace? Grow us, change us, shape us, transform us into the image of Jesus, free us from that anger. Help us to see areas of our lives where we have answered the question, I'm against you. I don't want that person or those people to be redeemed. I don't want this thing to change. I don't want you to give your grace and transformation to those people out there. Help us, God, by your grace and your power to move us into the position where we are not against you, but we are with you, being used by you, accepting your will as it comes, having your power lead us and guide us in our lives. Help us, God, to be unlike Jonah, not reluctant missionaries, but glad and happy missionaries bringing the gospel to any and every person who has ears to hear in our city. Would you use this, God, to bring this sweeping revival to our beloved city? Use this, God, to, to bring those in our lives that are the furthest away 
seemingly the most disqualified for your kingdom. Use us, God, to see them be brought in. Help us to see and believe that you can do it, that you're in the business of doing it. And if we ever need proof for it, help us to go back to Jonah and just see God saves the most wicked. God saves the persecutors, the evil. And if we don't believe it there, help us to look in the mirror and say, who was I to qualify for the grace of God? And yet you chose fit to save us, even us. Praise you in the name of Jesus, amen.